Hello, I'm Theo. Welcome to the second episode of this poorly informed mini-series on my favourite Prime Ministers, where I take three of my past favourite Prime Ministers and look at what they did, how they governed and what their legacy is. Last time we looked at Clement Attlee, the post-war Prime Minister who created the modern social state. This time we'll be looking at David Lloyd George, Prime Minister from 1916 to 1922. Most of us are only a little familiar with David Lloyd George. We know he was a wartime Prime Minister. He took over two years into the First World War, but not much more than that. He was part of a radical group in the Liberal Party and was a big proponent of better social equality and of spending vast government finances to get there. As a groundbreaking Chancellor, he introduced the first state benefits, greatly increased and upgraded by Attlee, 30 years later. He was a huge national presence, one of the most popular politicians of his age, but he wanted more. In 1916, he became Prime Minister. Lloyd George intended to change the way government and British society worked, but along the way, he also shook up the union and politics itself. And could his radicalism, his energy, his drive stay intact now he's a powerful politician? in Britain. Lloyd George was a long time Liberal. Formerly a middle class lawyer from North Wales, he rose rapidly through the ranks, coming to national attention in the early 1900s for his skills in speaking and policy solving. In 1908 he was appointed Chancellor and worked with Winston Churchill to create the first pensions, medical insurance and unemployment insurance were much smaller than the social safety net later created by Labour in the 40s. And through the early 1900s, Lloyd George increasingly became in favour of conflict with Germany. War duly kicked off in 1914. The Great War had begun. And it exposed deficiencies in decision making at the very top. Their strategic errors, such as the Gallipoli campaign in 1916 and logistical crises, such as the munitions shortage in 1915. Lloyd George made a splash when he was appointed as Minister of Munitions to solve that crisis, which he did so very effectively. Since 1910, the Liberal Prime Minister had been Herbert Asquith, but he had not responded well to the pressures of wartime. Media pressure was increasing and he was rapidly losing support. Lloyd George began to circle his position. In late 1916, Asquith was finally forced to resign and Lloyd George became Prime Minister as leader of the wartime coalition. But this created a deeply damaging split in the Liberal Party, which would come to haunt him later. However, the main issue facing Lloyd George at the time was, of course, World War I. And to respond to this, he made huge changes to the Downing Street system. Compared to today, the workloads of then Prime Ministers was minimal. They could read every single document they needed to read. They could manage and observe the affairs of most of the departments, make decisions on all and every decision that needed to be made. Civil servants did not have an active role in guiding policy and there were very few special advisers. Lloyd George and industrial warfare changed all of that. Asquith was rapidly swamped by his responsibilities. Lord George made the Downing Street system better at managing government and keeping track of decisions. Prime Ministerial power was centralised and concentrated properly for the first time in British history. This kind of fits with how he governed. Selden and Kavanaugh class him as a mobiliser Prime Minister, primarily concerned with the achievement of goals, not overly bothered about opposition and the cost of disturbance. We can see this in the way he pushed out Asquith. Lloyd George was an ends justifies the means operator. Because he was wartime Prime Minister, he operated a huge coalition with massive public support and collected vast amounts of power, something he greatly used. There was no accountability, no desire to question the legitimacy of any of his actions. In the words of Robert Blake, Lloyd George possessed eloquence, extraordinary charm and persuasiveness, a capacity to see the heart of problems and a profound sympathy with oppressed 
classes and races. But that same man also hid a love of devious methods and a streak of ruthlessness left little room for the cultivation of personal friendship. Lloyd George was a great agent of change, but you wouldn't trust him to referee a football match. For now though, this complex man was just what Britain needed. Lloyd George was explicitly committed to a knockout victory of Germany and acted like it. New ministries and dedicated areas of the war effort, convoys were established to limit submarine attacks and wartime spending reached quadruple pre-war levels. We assume now that Britain would always have fought to a complete victory over Germany, but this was not the case at the time. This was a government still responding to the damage and the carnage of the Somme, where British casualties numbered over 400,000. There were increasing calls for a negotiated peace. Even in the huge German Spring Offensive in 1918 though, Lloyd George held firm. He explicitly devoted to victory and takes some credit for the stiffening resolve of Allied forces when it looked like Germany might win the war. And true to form, later that year, Germany surrendered. The First World War was over. Three things swiftly happened. Firstly, an election was called. It was agreed that the wartime coalition would stay together in peacetime. MPs backed by the coalition would be on a special coalition recommended ticket or coupon. Sometimes this is called the coupon election. This agreement formally split the already divided Liberal Party and hammered its vote share permanently. The election returned a coalition of 500 MPs. Remember, there's only 650 MPs in Parliament overall. But this coalition was mostly made up of Conservatives. Lord George was tolerated as Prime Minister for his expertise and popularity, but the Conservatives now had the power to kick him out whenever they liked. Secondly, the issue of Ireland blew up, quite literally. Fudged and papered over for more than a century, Irish independence was now threatening large-scale rebellion, further incensed by a cack-handed British response. Lloyd George was forced to negotiate a settlement. In the words of Clark, again, this brought out the best and the worst in Lloyd George, as he bargained with the irreconcilable factions, telling it each what he felt it prudent, and finally threatening the Irish delegation with renewed war unless they signed. The result was, at long last, Irish independence from the United Kingdom, from the Union. But there were caveats. Northern Ireland had to be left behind, and Ireland swiftly went through a short, vicious civil war, both of which would cause deep underlying problems. Yet, the issue that had plagued British politics since time immemorial, Ireland within the Union, was now finally settled, in large part thanks to Lloyd George. Thirdly and finally, the world descended on Versailles for the Paris Peace Conference in 1919. Here, Europe and much of the world saw its borders settled and peace treaties signed. Central to the conference was the issue of Germany. Lloyd George wanted to preserve Germany as a trading partner to support British business, but the people across the empire were having none of it. Long seen as a champion of the people, here were the first signs Lloyd George was out of touch. The populations of Britain and its dominions had seen deep sacrifice and wanted to see justice some would say revenge. This left the final Treaty of Versailles much harsher than Lloyd George wanted. 6.6 .6 billion in reparations, army and territory savaged. But Lloyd George has enjoyed negotiations and he enjoyed being one of the big four delegates. He started to attend more foreign conferences and there were plenty across Europe in the early 20s, ignoring issues back home. And there were quite a few of these. The government had failed to successfully demobilise four million soldiers into the homes and jobs they promised them. Strikes were increasing, wages sinking below inflation, making workers poorer. Conservative-led cuts were implemented, harsh cuts. There was a sense that the coalition was out of touch. Increasing belief that Lloyd George had won the war but lost the peace. The coalition was too unaccountable and ineffective. Clark writes that it seemed to have degenerated into a coterie of mutual admiration rather than any other principle. The cabinet rarely met. Instead, a few men at the top decided 
everything far removed from reality. In 1922, papers emerged showing that the coalition had been selling knighthoods and peerages in return for party donations. For many, this was the final straw. A minor foreign diplomatic incident later that year gave the Conservatives the excuse to vote against the coalition. They formed their own government, kicking Lloyd George and the remnants of the Liberal Party into opposition. Lloyd George resigned that afternoon. An election was called, then another election, then another election, all in the space of just three years. When the dust settled, British politics had been changed forever. The Conservatives were Britain's largest party and have remained so ever since. In 1924, they secured the biggest majority in British history for a single party. The Young Labour Party was now Britain's second biggest party and has remained so ever since. It even formed a brief government in 1923 with Liberal support. And the Liberals, they'd had 400 seats in 1912. They now held just 40. Devastated by the coalition, they had become a shadow, a third party, relegated to the ranks of occasionally propping up small governments, never to play a major part in British politics again. Lloyd George hung on as an MP and he stuck around for the rest of his career and the rest of his life. But as Rob, Robert Blake puts it, the long twilight of Lloyd George's career was a melancholy anticlimax. He tried to leave the Liberals again in the late 1920s, but little came of it. And in 1945, just a few months before his death, this fiery radical populist from the valleys of Carnarvonshire was made an earl. It's easy to skim over Lloyd George's premiership and forget how sensational he was at the time. As Chancellor, he introduced the first state benefits. As Prime Minister, he committed Britain to victory in war, reformed the creaking Downing Street, arranged Irish independence, massively increased government involvement in public life and the economy. Very few Prime Ministers have changed so much. Even Clement Attlee was harnessing the mood at the time. Lloyd George was often out on his own, innovating, dreaming, and bringing the public with him behind the backs of the politicians. He was a deeply skilled Prime Minister who could untangle the knottiest problem and communicate like possibly no other Prime Minister in British history. But surely he lost his way. Too sucked in by the coalition, he ignored Britain's domestic problems post-war. He was giddy with success and was entrapped by power. He had few allies, fewer friends and no real base after splitting the Liberal Party. When he resigned, there was nothing waiting for him except conservative dominance. The Liberals would never govern alone again. Labour would see to that. And the Conservatives had ascended after 20 years in the wilderness to become Britain's undisputed first party. Never again would they have to wait so long for power. Since 1924, they have governed Britain for over a two thirds of the past century. Tradition-led governance has been the norm in the 20th and early 21st centuries. I wonder what Lloyd George would think about that. Next time, we'll be discussing a budget-balancing Conservative who severely angered his own party. See you then. Hey guys, thank you very much for watching this video. We really hope you enjoyed it and learned something new about David Lloyd George. If you want to find out more, there are some great resources I've included in the description. Do be sure to go check those out. If you enjoyed the video, please do consider giving us a like or subscribing to the channel. That would be really encouraging to us as well. It help keep motivating us to make more. If you want to watch the previous video, the Clement Attlee one, there should be a link on the screen somewhere. If you want to check out our channels or see what we do over our podcasting page and our blog, there should also be links on the screen or in description. There's some really cool and different stuff over there, so it would be lo lovely if you could check that out as well. As always, big thanks to Lewis, who has edited and produced this and spent many hours screaming at me um, to get a move on, and to the poorly informed team, who have always been supporting and encouraging through 
out. Thank you very much for watching, guys. I hope to see you for the next one. See if any of you can guess which Prime Minister is going to be next. Uh, that's all. Bye-bye.